Okay, well, welcome everybody. My name is Jason Baer. I'm a professor in the philosophy department. I'm also the current holder of the Robert H. Taylor SJ Chair in Philosophy. Today's talk is the fourth in a two-year series sponsored by the Taylor Chair and by the Academy for Catholic Thought and Imagination here at LMU. The series is titled Virtue Epistemology and Ignatian Spirituality and Pedagogy. Um, for those of you who aren't in the loop about this, virtue epistemology is an approach to the philosophical study of knowledge that foregrounds the personal qualities or character traits required for the successful pursuit of epistemic goods, goods such as knowledge, truth, understanding, and wisdom. The aim of the series is to try to put virtue epistemology into conversation with work on Ignatian or Jesuit spirituality and pedagogy. So far, the contributors to the series have come from the virtue epistemology uh, side of the aisle. Um, today's speaker, I'm pleased to report, comes from the Ignatian side. Uh, professor Stephen Mayhew is President's Professor of Rhetoric here at, at LMU, where he's taught since 2009. Prior to this, he was Chancellor's Professor of Rhetoric at UC Irvine, where he taught for nearly 20 years. He is a proud graduate of a place some of you might have heard of called Loyola University of Los Angeles, uh, where he completed a BA in 1972. <laughs> Professor Mayhew. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Mayhew teaches courses in rhetoric, critical theory, political theology, and US cultural studies. And he's author of many books, articles, and book chapters in these and related areas. One of Professor Mayhew's areas of specialization is Jesuit rhetoric. He's interested in how Jesuit rhetoric and the related notion of eloquentia perfecta might be brought to bear within a contemporary university context. He's also been kind enough and conscientious enough to study up uh, on virtue epistemology and, and, and virtue uh, ethics as well. So I think he's an ideal contributor to the series. In his talk today, which is titled Virtuous Imagination, Jesuit Rhetoric, and Ignatian Spirituality, he'll be addressing the question, how are intellectual virtues and moral virtues related within Ignatian spiritual and Jesuit traditions? Um, the format will go as follows. He'll talk for 45 to 50 minutes or so. That will be followed by uh, uh, period of questions and answers for maybe another 20 or 30 minutes. Please do feel free to get up and get refreshments. Um, you don't have to wait till afterwards to get a drink or some crackers or cheese. Um, before I welcome <coughs> Professor Mayu up, I want to say thank you to Emmy Liu from APTI and to Brian Trainer for helping sponsor the event and especially to uh, also to Alexis Dolan for help with all, last minute help with all of the uh, refreshments. I hope she can hear me. Um, there she is, okay, thank you. Um, um, yes, that's it. So uh, please join me in welcoming up uh, Professor Mayo. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Jason. Can you all hear me without the microphone? Yes. Yeah? Yes. How about Charlie? Can you, you hear me? It. Okay. Um, I'll be coming in and out of it. Um, I want to thank Jason for um, inviting me across our disciplines to um, join the conversation on virtue epistemology and, and Ignatian spirituality. I'd like, also like to thank uh, ACTI for sponsoring the series, and especially Brian for not withdrawing his funds when he heard that I was going to be the fourth speaker. <laughs> uh, thanks also to Kat, and especially Emmy Lou. Thank you for the logistics. America needs to reemphasize intellectual honesty, open-mindedness, logical thinking, objectivity, and robust, respectful debate if it is to be a nation of shared values and shared truths. My paper today can be seen as an extended rhetorical gloss on this passage, to which I'll return in my uh, conclusion. On the way to that conclusion, though, I'd like to explore how moral virtues and intellectual virtues 
work together within the performance of the Ignatian spiritual exercises. In so doing, I'm continuing what the previous three speakers began, showing how virtue epistemology provides a deeper understanding of the exercises. And perhaps I'll add something by showing how thinking about the exercises contributes potential insights into virtue epistemology. My paper is divided into three parts. Part one, I'll summarize some points about virtue epistemology made by the first three lecturers in the series, and this will sort of introduce some of you to the terminology of virtue epistemology. Others you'll just be here for a review. Then in part two, I'll um, develop some claims about the way moral virtues and intellectual virtues function within the exercise, especially within particular meditations that encourage what I'm calling virtuous imagination. In this middle part, I foreground the complementarity between virtue epistemology and the exercises, how the former helps us understand the workings of the latter, and perhaps vice versa. Then, in part three, I take up some possible interdisciplinary applications of this complementarity by focusing on Jesuit rhetoric in history and in higher education. So part one. I'll begin with a general definition, I think one consistent with what the three previous lectures have assumed. Intellectual virtues are characteristics that enable intellectual flourishing, enable the successful achievement of knowledge and understanding. Our second lecture in the series, Nancy Snow, organized her presentation around the two standard approaches to these intellectual virtues within virtue epistemology, reliabilism and responsibilism. Reliabilists view intellectual virtues as reliable cognitive faculties, such as perception, memory, reason, intuition, and imagination. Responsibilists view intellectual virtues as character traits, promoting the discovery of truth, such as curiosity, open-mindedness, intellectual perseverance, and imaginativeness. Cognitive faculties versus character traits. Now, I'll return in part two of my, of my talk to this distinction between faculty-oriented and character-oriented versions of virtual epistemology, but for now, I'll just say that throughout my paper, I follow Jason Baer in viewing intellectual virtues more specifically as excellences of character that play a positive role in the context of inquiry. Intellectual virtues are character traits that help us to meet inquiry-relevant challenges in our search for truth, our attempts at knowledge and understanding. Such a view of intellectual virtues as inquiry-oriented character traits is particularly helpful for discussing the Ignatian spiritual exercises, both as inquiries into the retreatant's self, examinations of conscience, and as imaginative inquiries into how that self might act within imagined biblical narratives. Professor Baer usefully presents a general summary of epistemic character traits in his book, Inquiry Minds. And I should add that this book is, a, is an excellent introduction to the uh, field of virtue epistemology and the debates uh, with, within it. Um, I, I hope that that compliment will allow me to give over all hard questions from <laughs> Q&A to, uh, to Jason. Um, an inquiry-oriented view of intellectual virtues is consistent with Professor Snow's, our second lectures, focus in her lecture on what she called virtues of introspection. These virtues of introspection are intellectual virtues promoted by the spiritual exercises that, quote, help us explore the interior landscape of the self, considering such questions as, who am I? What is my role in the cosmos? What is the meaning of life? Snow's convincing argument was that these intellectual virtues of introspection are cultivated in performing the exercise. 
virtues such as self-scrutiny, intellectual courage, intellectual humility. Our third lecture in the series, Stephen Grimm, focused on only one intellectual virtue in his talk, perspective taking. But his main emphasis was on how virtuous perspective taking could be achieved through the guidance of Ignatius Loyola in his famous letter on obedience. I'm going to return to Professor Grimm's uh, analysis in part two and apply it specifically to the spiritual exercises which, which Professor Grimm didn't do. Now the first lecture in our series, Linda Zagzebski made an interesting case for what she called exemplarist moral theory, but what I want to emphasize here is an issue she takes up in her earlier seminal work, Virtues of the Mind. Moral virtues versus intellectual virtues, the distinction between these two forms of virtue. Now, there's disagreement within virtue epistemology um, about how to conceptualize exactly this distinction between moral virtues and, and intellectual virtues. But for my purposes here, it's only important that there's at least one principled distinction between moral and intellectual virtues. And I believe there is, if, even if the two kinds are closely <coughs> interrelated. Zagzewski argues that intellectual virtues are a subset of moral virtues. That intellectual virtues are a subset of moral virtues. But nevertheless, she still notes a difference between the two based on the distinctive motivation of intellectual virtues. She writes, the simplest way to describe motivational basis of the intellectual virtues is to say that they're all based on the motivation for knowledge. They are all forms of the motivation to have cognitive contact with reality. Other moral virtues, other non-epistemic moral virtues, by contrast, do not have this motivation as primary. Similarly, in his book, Inquiring Mind, Professor Baer provides a useful taxonomy of intellectual virtues like uh, curiosity, uh, attentiveness, uh, open-mindedness, and imaginativeness. Defining them as character traits that help us to meet inquiry-relevant challenges in our intellectual endeavors. In contrast, moral virtues like piety and obedience do not necessarily serve this epistemic function. So a distinction between moral virtues and intellectual virtues. Part two. Now I'd like to turn directly to the spiritual exercises. I'll try to expand on how virtue epistemology helps us understand the exercise as practice and theory, and how a certain interpretation of the exercises relates to disciplinary debates within virtue epistemology itself. Now, as most of you know, Ignatius Loyola composed the spiritual exercises as a series of um, meditations, uh, contemplations, vocal and mental prayers, examinations of conscience, and other practices such as following rules for spiritual uh, discernment. Um, on the left there is the, the Latin version of the, the exercises, a 16th century copy, and this is an English version, one that's often used here at uh, LMU uh, for the um, uh, spiritual exercises for busy people that the, uh, uh, is uh, uh, available for those that are, that are interested. Ignatius presents the daily exercises organized loosely over four weeks, during which a retreatant works with a spiritual advisor to improve his or her life. A stated goal of the exercises is to help the retreatant make an election, a vocational choice. That is, performing the exercises involves forming what Ignatius calls a well-formed disposition for making a significant decision about committing to a life vocation or other important decisions. Now, in discussing the spiritual exercises, I'll build on the arguments of the previous lectures in claiming that both virtue epistemology and virtue ethics provide a useful vocabulary 
and conceptual framework for better understanding and explaining the spiritual exercise. I'll focus on three points. First, virtue ethics and epistemology provide a more <coughs> precise way of describing the formation of character that takes place during the successful performance of the exercises. Second, they provide a more nuanced vocabulary for explaining the terminology explicitly used by Ignatius in the exercises. And, and here's where I'll discuss the role of uh, imagination and the uh, intellectual virtue of uh, imaginativeness. And then I'll make my third point. Virtue ethics and epistemology provide a useful framework for understanding how moral virtues and intellectual virtues articulate, interrelate in specific ways during the performance of the exercises. First point. Virtue ethics and epistemology provide a more precise way of describing the formation of character that takes place during the successful performance of the exercises. Well, oh, ah, bad. Oh, so I even got to see that. <laughs> I have to take that out now. Let's see. Let's see. Wow. Yes, you did. Okay, here we go. Okay. Now you don't have to stay for the rest of the time. <laughs> Uh, uh, the two most challenging things about preparing for this talk, it, it wasn't uh, learning about virtue epistemology. It was learning how to use this, this uh, thing. I hadn't used one in, in 10 years. And the other thing was pronouncing Professor Zagzebski's name. <laughs> okay. And uh, I got the one but blew the other. Okay, okay so uh, what I was about to say was <laughs> um, that uh, the uh, historian and... Um, and a philosopher, uh, the late historian and philosopher, Michel Foucault, in his final lectures in the Collège de France, called uh, the apparatuses like the spiritual exercises technologies of the self. Here he followed the work of the ph philosophical historian Pierre Hadeau, who had uh, placed the spiritual exercise, Ignatian spiritual exercise, with a long Western tradition of similar disciplining practices, pagan and Christian, in which a practitioner works with a spiritual director. Viewed within this Foucauldian perspective, the Ignatian spiritual exercises can be described as a Jesuit technology of the self that shapes character in the following way. During the exercises, there is an ordering of the retreatant's inner life, an ordering that might be called an aesthetics of experience, an ordering that is best understood as a self-directed ethics tied to an other-directed politics, an ethics, an aesthetics, an ethics of politics. Now let me try to explain this description with the help of virtue, ethics, and epistemology. In the spiritual exercises, the first sentence of the principle and foundation faithfully declares, human beings are created to praise, reverence, and serve God. This declaration is the founding principle underlying all the exercises. And it is reiterated in the preparatory prayer uh, before each exercise daily. The preparatory prayer is to ask God, our Lord, for the grace that all my intentions, actions, and operations may be ordered purely to the service and praise of his divine, divine majesty. In this way, through the declaration of the principles and the supplication of the prayer, the moral virtue of piety is presented as a reverential attitude manifested through words and of praise and service in deed. The moral virtue of piety. A second moral virtue promoted in the exercises is obedience. 
to which I'll return uh, later. Both piety and obedience are moral virtues that then get linked with intellectual virtues. To order our intentions and actions to, so that they are pious and obedient, we must practice the intellectual virtues so that we can understand ourselves and the world properly. Intellectual virtues such as self-scrutiny and virtuous perspective taking. Thus, virtue ethics and epistemology allow us to describe the spiritual exercises as self-technologies forming the retreatant's character by encouraging the adoption of and practice in both moral and intellectual virtues, the ordering of which provides a kind of aesthetics of experience, the forming of a well-ordered disposition for making an election, a well-ordered attitude for discerning and deliberating choices about one's future vocation in life. Now, before describing that ordering in more detail, I want to move on to my uh, second point. It's not just that virtue ethics and epistemology present um, conceptual resources for understanding the shaping of character within the exercises. They also provide a more nuanced vocabulary for explaining the terminology explicitly used by Ignatius in the exercises. Now, up to this moment, I've been emphasizing and employing the character-oriented view of intellectual virtues, uh, responsibilism. But you remember, uh, I did it again. Um, But you remember that I mentioned that there are two um, uh, views within virtue epistemology, responsibilism and, um, and reliabilism. Okay. Reliabilism is emphasize the cognitive virtues, responsibilism, uh, character traits. Now, though some virtue epistemologists, again, um, uh, challenge this distinction between faculty and character approaches, the distinction is helpful in understanding the explicit terminology of the exercises. In fact, Ignatius in the spiritual exercises used terminology related to both of these views. Related to the faculty-oriented reliabilism, we find Ignatius explicitly referring to human faculties. For example, the very first exercise in the first week is described as a meditation using the three powers of the soul, that is, memory, intellect, and will, in order to contemplate the general and particular histories of sin. The retreatant is asked to use his or her memory to go over the first sins in supernatural and natural history, human history, and then to reason about the sin's consequences, and finally, attempt to move the will to repentance for one's own sins. Alongside Ignatius' use of faculty-oriented vocabulary, we also find him referring explicitly to the virtues as character traits. In fact, in three methods of prayer in the exercises, he references, I mean, he puts references to faculties and interweaves them with directives on moral and intellectual virtues as character traits understanding the commandments and practicing the virtues contrary to the seven vices. So these are some of the ways that virtue ethics and epistemology provide a rich vocabulary for describing faculties and character traits explicitly named in the exercises. But it's also the case that the spiritual exercises present something of a challenge to virtue ethics and epistemology a challenge to develop even more comprehensive accounts of certain faculty-oriented and trait-oriented virtues in the exercises. So my chief example is the faculty of imagination and the character trait of imaginativeness, which I'm lumping together under the term virtuous imaginal. 
I'll use as my, my main focus in the spiritual exercises what Ignatius calls composition of place. In the spiritual exercises, the retreatant is formed as a pious subject through the performance of meditations, including contemplations of biblical narratives through the practice of composition of place. In the first exercise of the first week, Ignatius describes how a composition is made by imagining the place of the meditation subject matter, sin, whatever. When a contemplation is about something that can be gazed on, for example, a contemplation of Christ our Lord, who is visible, the composition consists of seeing in imagination the physical place where that which I want to contemplate is taking place. For instance, a temple or a mountain where Jesus Christ happens to be in accordance with the topic that I desire to contemplate. In these contemplations of place, the retreatant imagines an embodied person's talking and acting in scenes. And sometimes the retreatant imaginably places him or herself as an actor in the biblical narrative being imagined. Thus there is a, a pious imagining of being, talking, and acting in the past, remembering the narratives, that is followed by a pious self-reflection and imagined speaking in the present. This is through a colloquy, uh, an imagined colloquy at the end of the exercise which hopefully will result in pious habits of acting in the future through a willed decision. Now, the imaginative compositions of place that Ignatius encourages is not primarily a kind of abstract thinking about a, Bible's, a Bible story's plot or, or, or the theme, how characters interact, for example, to illustrate some theological proposition. No, rather... The contemplation is, is a contemplative experience achieved by following Ignatius' <coughs> instructions to use the imagination and apply the five senses. For example, in contemplating the nativity story, the birth of Christ, retreatants are asked to see persons in specific material locations, um, traveling on the road, um, arriving at the birthplace, to hear what they say, to smell the fragrance and taste of the infinite sweetness of everything there, and to touch, so to speak, embrace and kiss the places where the persons walk or sit. In various compositions of place based on biblical narratives, Ignatius again and again encourages the retreatant to project him or herself imaginatively into the narrative scene to see how he or she will think or act. So, how should we understand the spiritual exercises in their use of imagination and encouragement of imaginativeness? Here, the field of virtue epistemology doesn't really help us very much, for it has not really given the intellectual virtue of imaginativeness the detailed attention that it's given other intellectual virtues. Now, at um, one point, I thought that I was going to courageously become the person who gave the first full-blown uh, <laughs> comprehensive analysis of imagine to this. I soon uh, discovered my hubris. Um, I clearly failed to practice the intellectual virtue of intellectual humility. Um, which, by the way, has received careful and detailed attention within virtue epistemology. So, uh, properly humbled, um, I'm just going to make a couple of preliminary suggestions toward a future detailed analysis of imaginativeness as an intellectual virtue. Now, in my um, uh, in literary studies, which is my home discipline, um, not necessarily spiritual exercises, um, uh, there are, of course, several models for talking about literary imagination and narrative imaginativeness in particular. And some, working within virtue ethics, have found these models useful in discussing the relation between narrative experience and moral imperatives. Indeed, our 
own colleague here, Brian Trainer, has published a book called Implotting Virtue, uh, Implotting Virtue, which proposes, quote, a narrative approach to environmental ethics. Besides finding significant resources in uh, philosophy, Trainer also uses literary critics, such as Wayne Booth and his Ethics of Fiction. For Trainer, not only does narrative help us to identify and understand virtues by exposing us to more nuance and variety than we could ever experience in actual life, it also is involved in the actual cultivation of the virtue. We might think of Trainer's claim here as describing how an intellectual virtue of imaginativeness works in helping us to understand and develop certain moral virtues. Consistent with Ignatius' instructions about compositions of place, Trainer makes a distinction between someone simply copying the virtuous character in a story and someone who, quote, imaginatively projects oneself into the narrative, end quote, and then using the intellectual virtue of phronesis, practical wisdom, prudence, to decide how to act once you're within the narrative. So let me pause here and uh, combine the insights of my first two points to make some generalizations about the spiritual exercises. In certain contemplations, the exercises rely on imagination and imaginativeness to cause emotions and inspire understandings that move the will to follow the intellect motivated by faith, grounded and resulting in love. It is the goal of the Ignatian discernment to recognize and develop these internal motions into a well-ordered attitude for preparing to make an election, a life of decision of vocation. Ideally for retreatants, these movements within become movements without. Turning inward in self-reflection results in turning outward to become contemplatives in action. Pious subjects becoming men and women for and with others. Again, the well-ordering of the retreatant's disposition establishes an aesthetics of experience, an inner ordering, which prepares the retreatant to make a vocational choice through a self-regarding ethical reflection, resulting in a commitment to an other-regarding politics. Now to move on to my... Third point, moral virtues and intellectual virtues articulate in distinctive ways in the performance of the exercises. Now, I've already alluded to one of these ways in talking about um, virtuous imagining. The intellectual virtues of imaginativeness combine with the intellectual virtue of practical wisdom, phronesis, to guide the retreatant to gain insights into moral virtues during his or her compositions of place. But there's another interesting articulation between moral and intellectual virtues promoted in the exercises. And here, I'm heavily depending upon a certain interpretation, it might be a misinterpretation, of Professor Grimm's argument about obedience and perspective taking, based on the Ignatian uh, famous 1553 letter on obedience. In that later letter, Ignatius distinguishes three stages of obedience in the Jesuits' relationship to his superior. The first, is, the first stage is obedience of action, in which the individual Jesuit disagrees with the superior's order, but follows it anyway, let's say out of, out of fear of punishment. But then in stage two, the obedience of will, the Jesuit obeys, but now out of love and respect for his superior, but still without full conviction. Stage three, obedience of understanding. Obedience of understanding is the Jesuit has the same will. He's come to the same, have the same will, the same mind, the same understanding of his superior. That is, he thinks as his superior thinks. 
He views the world as the, the, the superior views the world. Now, stage one and two of obedience call for the performance of moral virtues, but not primarily intellectual virtues. While stage three of obedience is best seen, I think, as an intellectual virtue. Obedience in the first stages does not involve necessarily a change in the obedient Jesuits' beliefs or knowledge. Whereas obedience in the third stage definitely involves an epistemic or a hermeneutic dimension at its center. Can we say then that Ignatius' three-stage schema represents within the obedient Jesuit a non-epistemic moral virtue being transformed into an intellectual virtue? Or maybe it's better to characterize this movement through three stages of obedience as a process in which the moral virtue, virtues of stage one and two, motivate the acquiring of the intellectual virtue of stage three. In any case, this transformation or motivation process is described in Ignatius's famous 1553 letter. But it's also at play in the spiritual exercises themselves most notoriously in the 13th rule of the so-called rules for thinking, judging, and feeling with the church. This is the rule of orthodoxy. To keep ourselves right in all things, we ought to hold fast to this principle. What I see as white, I will believe to be black if the hierarchical church thus determines it. In the commentaries on the spiritual exercise, as you can imagine, there have been many attempts to soften the authoritarian <laughs> big brother aspects of this, of this rule of orthodoxy. And I'm going to summarize one of these in the final part of my, of my talk. But for now, I simply want to note that this recommendation of this rule can be seen as the culmination within the exercises themselves of moving the retreatant from the moral virtue of obedience into the intellectual virtue of obedient perspective taking of one superior. And I want to suggest that similar processes of transformation are presented in the spiritual exercises in promoting other virtues. For example, the virtue of, my favorite, humility, in the section called Three Ways of Being Humble during week two of the exercises, Ignatius outlines three ways of practicing the moral virtue of being humble. These ways start with a humility in which the retreatant simply, out of humility, obeys the law of God, a moral virtue, and then moves toward a more perfect humility in which the retreatant sees the world as Christ did desiring and choosing poverty rather than wealth, and embracing being viewed as a useless fool for Christ rather than a wise or prudent person in this world. So this is a kind of Christian intellectual humility, one that sort of ironically purports to reject another intellectual virtue, practical wisdom or prudence, at least a version of that Aristotelian uh, virtue as understood by the non-Christian world. Now, I think there's other... Um, interesting instances of this articulation between moral and intellectual virtues within the exercises. Um, the moral virtue of piety, I think, also uh, moves toward becoming an intellectual virtue. To sum up these three po points of, of, of this middle section of my paper, I've tried to show additional ways that virtue epistemology provides a deeper understanding of the dynamics of the spiritual exercises as technologies of the self. And I've suggested that the relation between moral and intellectual virtues within the exercises might inspire further thinking about that relation within virtue epistemology. <clears throat> Part three, Jesuit rhetoric, um, or interdisciplinary applications of virtue epistemology. In this final, much, much, much shorter section, um, I'll return to my opening quotation. This quotation is a passage from an LA Times editorial just two months ago. 
Sometimes it feels as if facts are now derived from opinions rather than the other way around. That needs to stop. America needs to reemphasize intellectual honesty, open-mindedness, logical thinking, objectivity, and most respectful debate if it is to be a nation of shared values and shared truths. I quote this from the popular press in order to start a brief discussion of practical applications of the academic framework of virtue epistemology. In this LA editorial, we could say that there's a kind of uh, folk responsibilism, intellectual virtues viewed as desirable epistemic character traits uh, that can be seen uh, at work in this non-academic public sphere. And I join others in suggesting that virtue epistemology within the discipline of philosophy provides a valuable terminological and conceptual resources, not only for the specialized studies of spirituality and uh, moral theology, but also in other disciplines and interdisciplines, including intellectual history, cultural studies, and educational theory and practice. And so in conclusion, I'm just going to give two examples of this applied uh, virtue epistemology, both taken from my real field, uh, rhetorical studies. For simplicity's sake, let's define rhetoric as, and all my students will know what's coming here, uh, the use of language in a context to have effects. Uh, this is supposed to be a, a, a general definition that, that uh, uh, is a catch-all that you can put any definition um, of, uh, of rhetoric in. Um, I'm using rhetoric right now, the rhetoric of, of, of uh, intellectual virtues, um, in a context, this, this talk, in order to have effects, hopefully to impress you that somebody from the English department can give a good talk in the, in the philosophy department. Um, uh, and this is, is the, the way that I want to understand these two examples. Um, they'll all be focused in some way on the use of language in a context to have effects, just switching, switching the, the context. Okay. My first example comes from the context of social political history and the second from educational practice. I've recently been working on an um, intellectual history of 20th, 20th century commentaries on the spiritual exercises, um, especially those written by Jesuits who have been influenced by continental philosophy. And one of the most interesting figures that, that I've come up with in this, in this reception study is the French Jesuit Gaston Fassard. In the 30s, Fassard wrote a, the core of a commentary on the spiritual exercises while he studied to become an academic philosopher. Then, during World War, II, World War II, he wrote underground pamphlets against the collaborationist Vichy government in France, helping to found the Catholic resistance movement. After the war, he became a highly respected uh, um, academic scholar of German philosophy. Underlying Fassard's work, both as an academic and as a public intellectual, was an ongoing engagement with the dialectic of Hegel. Indeed, one might characterize his very difficult commentary on the exercises partly as a Hegelian reinterpretation of the spiritual exercises. In the 1956 preface to the commentary, for example, The Dialectic of the Spiritual Exercises, Fassard summarizes the tropes, the rhetorical figures that form the basis for his intervention in contemporary politics. He notes how, quote, the dialectics of pagan and Jew, master and slave, man and woman, fundamental themes constantly used in his analysis of historical situations are the same type of dialectic as the before and after of the election within the exercise themselves. And then that becomes a very long argument of how he puts those, those all together. But so the simple point I want to make, though, in analyzing and redescribing Fassard's political theological work in the public sphere, I found useful the vocabulary of virtue ethics and virtue epistemology. For example, in the 1960s, Fassard used his Hegelian interpretation of the exercises to explore the problem of dialogue between believing Christians and atheistic communists, examining what we might call the rhetorical conditions of possibility 
for those dialogues. Those conditions begin, he argued, with the requirement that all participants in the dialogue must share beliefs, at least, in the existence of truth and the value of liberty. I think these pre prerequisites for successful dialogue between partisan opponents might be better described in terms of required intellectual virtues, such as open-mindedness, intellectual justice, intellectual honesty, and intellectual fairness, as we saw in the LA Times uh, editorial about the Trump-era partisanship. But I'll also have to admit that it's not always easy to evaluate when such intellectual virtues are being practiced. Take the following example from Fassard's own declared attempt to open a dialogue between Christians and communists in France during the 1960s. After establishing a framework of respecting truth and valuing liberty as rhetorical conditions of possibility for dialogue, Fassard notes how both Catholicism and communism rely on the obedience of their respective proponents. Communists must believe what the party says, while Catholics must be equally loyal to the magisterium of the church. Fassard quotes from the spiritual exercises as support, the rule of orthodoxy in the spiritual exercise, which I discussed earlier. What I see as white, I will believe to be black if the hierarchical church thus determines it. Fassard suggests that this rule applies to both communists and Catholic faithful. He says that all one need do is replace hierarchical church with the party. And we will, quote, see that this rule is that of the communist as well as that of the Jesuit, end quote. But Fassard goes on to claim that there's a difference, a difference that is everything. The Jesuit believer has a safeguard lacking in the Communist Party member, the safeguard of conscience. This limit is written into the Constitution of the Society of Jesus, where Ignatius himself says that we must obey blindly, quote, in everything only where sin is not seen. That is, we must obey God rather than men, end quote. Bassard adds, quote, such is the highest principle justifying disobedience to the highest human authorities, end quote. This safeguard is missing for the communist. Bassard concludes, ready as well as I to believe black what he sees as white if the party so decides, the communist cannot, as I can, bring up in opposition the exception of sin. For obviously, to say to an atheist it's better to obey God than men makes absolutely no sense. Now, I'll leave it to you to decide whether this is clear, honest reasoning, practicing intellectual honesty, or whether it might smack just a little of Jesuitical casuistry. Okay. And instead, I'll turn to my, to my last closing uh, example of applied virtue epistemology. This is the general domain of educational theory and practice, specifically curricular development and um, classroom pedagogy. A good amount of work's already been done in this area, uh, including the founding uh, by Jason and uh, um, others of a um, high school based on virtue epistemology. But I just want to add one example of my own, the revision of the LMU core curriculum, at least in its ideal, uh, with its introduction of the course rhetorical arts. Simply put, virtue ethics and virtue epistemology are crucial tools for teaching such courses like rhetorical arts today. The rhetorical arts course aims to join the current effort to revitalize the long tradition of Jesuit rhetoric, eloquentia perfecta. Today, this tradition is being reinvented in many of the 28 Jesuit colleges and universities across the country. Here's part of the description of the rhetorical arts course. Based on the Jesuit rhetorical tradition, this course fosters articulate expression, 
critical thinking, and moral reflection, enabling students to engage in written and oral debate with persuasive force and stylistic excellence. Emerging out of Renaissance humanism, Jesuit rhetoric, or eloquenti perfecta, developed the classical <coughs> ideal of the good person writing and speaking well for the public good, and promotes the teaching of eloquence combined with erudition and moral discernment. This course attempts to reinvent Jesuit rhetoric for the contemporary era. First, it combines teaching, oral and written rhetoric, speech listening, and writing reading that have been separated until recently. Second, Jesuit rhetoric today also needs to include other forms of literacy, just as the Jesuits of the 16th century came to terms with the media revolution of that era, the 15th century invention of the dissemination of the printing press, so too today should Jesuit rhetoric of the 21st century engage the digital revolution, including new media technologies that are visual, oral, and kinesthetic, as well as verbal. Third, Jesuit rhetoric today is taught within the Ignatian paradigm of experience, reflection, action, and evaluation, a pedagogy aimed at educating the whole person and producing men and women for and with others. Jesuit rhetoric incorporates these pedagogical goals by integrating eloquence and critical thinking with moral discernment, thus continuing the humanistic tradition of conceiving the ideal rhetor as the good person writing and speaking well for the public good. How do we conceptualize the good person writing and speaking well for the public good? I believe that virtue ethics and virtue epistemology provide one of the most useful vocabularies for describing this pedagogical goal. We can think of the good person not only as practicing moral virtues such as other-directed justice, but also as practicing intellectual virtues such as self-scrutiny, intellectual humility, and open-mindedness. Writing and speaking well can be seen as including the promotion of epistemic goods through communication. In these ways, Rhetorical arts combines moral and intellectual virtues to achieve the civic virtue of promoting the common good. Moreover, in the practice of all these virtues, discernment about which ones to practice where and when reminds us of the importance of the Aristotelian intellectual virtue of phronesis, practical wisdom. And practical wisdom is exactly what rhetorical arts attempts to promote, not extrinsic to rhetoric, but as part of its very definition. As Aristotle said, rhetoric is the ability to see in any particular situation the available means of persuasion. Phronesis is the intellectual virtue that enables this scene in theory and then in relation to other moral and intellectual virtues provides the basis for practice for achieving the ideal of the good person writing and speaking well for the public good. And now Phronesis is telling me it's time to end this talk. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. First, I just want to say thank you so much. When I envisioned this series that this is the, an installment in, um, this is just exactly what I was hoping might come out of it. So I really want to thank you for, for diving deep and sharing your expertise from across the aisle. Um, I feel like you've vindicated the sense I had when, 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 when proposing something like this, that there were fruitful connections to be made. So, and, and then the other thing I want to say is that um, uh, your point about um, the exercises you were gentle about this, but that the exercises might have something for um, virtue epistemologists to, to learn from is very well taken, and here's how I might um, uh, articulate it myself. The exercises des describe um, volitionally robust and rich epistemic activity. It's not just epistemic activity. Um, um, but it's, in particular, it's, it's volitionally robust epistemic activity with a highly imaginative dimension. 
and you couldn't be more right that virtue epistemologists have tended to neglect the role of imagination in the intellectual life or the epistemic life. So, so this just you've really put a point on it for me that 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 we virtue epistemologists can learn from looking at different kinds of epistemic activities, um, not all of which fit the paradigm of philosophical or scientific inquiry. So I, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, Thank you I, will, I will be happy to, to moderate. I don't know everybody here. There are a lot of people here, which is wonderful. But you can go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll do my best to keep track of folks. Uh, Brian. Steve, thanks very much. One thing I, I did hear you speak about as you were talking about imagination and imaginativeness uh, is the role of the spiritual director. And what made me think about that is specifically uh, you raised the, the contribution of Wayne Booth to my own way of thinking about this. So Wayne Booth stresses the importance of what he calls co-duction, right? the specific type of reasoning that we do in dialogue with others that gives us certain in, in this language, epistemic goods that would be um, uh, ungraspable to an individual on his own. So could you say, I mean, in a way this is also suggested by your, um, your invocation of the, the rule of orthodoxy and things like this, but what's the role of, of an interlocutor, whether it's a spiritual director or not, in the proper use of imagination and the other epistemic or moral goods it can get us? Uh, Father Roach isn't here. Uh, Randy Roach isn't here, right? Okay, good. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, he did a great job um, um, uh, directing me in the spiritual exercises. Yeah. Hi, Randy. Um, and I learned a lot from, from him uh, precisely about that, that point. Um, in, in addressing compositions of place, well, in doing the spiritual exercise in general, I always had a, a, a problem. And it had to do with, with the, um, the distinction between um, really getting into an experience and saying, ooh, isn't that interesting? Reflecting on the experience and trying to make some kind of, of, of intellectual, what's the next article I'm going to do? Oh, this will really fit into that. And uh, that became a, a, a distraction uh, from me because I was learning so much um, about uh, Processes of meditation and imagination and 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 uh, um, and faith and as I as I went forward with um, uh, with uh, Father Roche uh, on this, uh, but I would be distracted. I say, "Oh gosh," um, and then I'd be reflecting on. It. And so what he would constantly do was give me uh, uh, strategies for trying to stay within the experience. And uh, sometimes these were daunting. Um, and, and worked in the reverse, because he would give examples of people who uh, uh, he had worked with who had um, done the compositions of place, and when they did um, the, the nativity scene, uh, in their imaginations, uh, they were handed the Christ child, <laughs> and I could barely get myself you know, within the manger. Um, uh, and so, so uh, it was clear that, the, that some of my uh, abilities to imagine as deeply were not were not as 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 developed as they as they uh, needed uh, needed to be. But he was a, a constant interlocutor in inspiring to uh, try harder and to use certain metaphors. He had certain kind of metaphors about how you would um, uh, figure out your motions of desolation or consolation, and those were also very. Uh, uh, very, very important. So the director is a, a guide, but not a guide, but it's a guide that, that has uh, his own uh, phronetic, his or her own phronetic um, uh, uh, challenges, because having to decide how much to encourage or how much to push or how much to direct and then when to, to step back. And so I think that, that the spiritual director is a special kind of of um, interlocutor within the spiritual exercises. And just one last thing about that is that that's what's so interesting about the last lectures of Foucault uh, in talking about uh, these long traditions of, this, of the uh, spiritual exercise and these technologies of, uh, of the self. And um, uh, because of talking about the different ways the directors can act and the different kinds of, 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 of um, uh, ways those interactions can, can, take, can take place. <laughs>
Steve, thanks so much. I was really interested in your discussion of the dynamic interplay between the moral and the intellectual virtues in your discussion of that obedience letter. Um, and, and clearly there's a, a real progression there, as you, you sort of got at, from this obedience of, uh, of, uh, of action to obedience of will to eventually obedience of understanding from that movement from moral to kind of intellectual virtue. And there seemed to be a kind of implicit hierarchy there, right? That the that the disciplining of the moral would lead to an improved way uh, of understanding. And, and I'm, I'm curious about the sort of reverse of that, which seems operable in, in other places. For instance, in the letter from the LA Times, where if we're not going to be good moral people, if we can just learn how to, how to understand and sort of practice um, uh, that kind of intellectual uh, virtue, then we might actually get to moral virtue someday. But for the time being, we'll at least take intellectual virtue, which is a little bit more honest and leads to better functioning societies. Um, and I'm thinking, too, in terms of other places um, um, with Ignatius, one of the passages you did talk about, and I wondered if you come around to it at some point, is the, is the Ignatian, the presupposition, the last of those annotations before the uh, before the, the, the principle and foundation where um, Ignatius encourages us always to put you know, the best or better interpretation on what we hear um, as, a, again, a way of sort of self-disciplining. Um, don't go to, to sort of where we want to, but how can we discipline our understanding? And, and the assumption to me always <coughs> that was by disciplining that understanding, we would eventually get to the point where we would just be sort of better moral people and not jump to the wrong understanding or bad conclusions about our interlocutors. Um, in the in the first place, and I think it's the same thing that's happening in one of the other famous letters, which is a letter to the the folks at Trent, um, where he says, you know, just shut up and listen, don't say anything. If you absolutely have to say something, make sure you say at the end of it, um, you know, that's my feeling. Unless somebody thinks better, in which case I'm happy to be sort of told otherwise. So I'm really I'm interested in that that the exchange between the kind of or the interplay between the moral and the intellectual, and how you understand those working in Ignatius, and, and whether the one sort of shapes or leads to the other, is there a kind of hierarchy, is he inconsistent as he is in some of the other things? Um, uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, a, a, a couple of things. One, one is that, that uh, this, this was um, something that I had hoped would happen, um, that there would, by being invited to, to, to uh, uh, learn more about virtue epistemology that I would get into some of the disciplinary debates. And it's on, on that first point about the relationship between um, intellectual virtues and moral virtues and how you define that, where there's a lot of really interesting um, uh, discussion uh, going on. I just picked out one, one uh, point of that in that one uh, 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 diagram, uh, and that was to then to, to say that um, to take, take a position that, um, that intellectual virtues are a subset of moral virtues. So in that sense, uh, if, if that's the case, and, and that's still debatable, there's a lot more to, to, to say about that, about how you define both, um, then uh, I think that spiritual exercises show various relationships right. okay. between those. And sometimes it does, it does seem like it's a hierarchy, and this is what, what uh, some rhetoricians call the amplification strategy that, that, uh, that Ignatius does. He starts with something you know, uh, the minor and then builds it up, builds it up, builds it up. Um, you, know, you have a venial sin and you have a mortal sin and, you, you know, and, and um, that kind of strategy he also does with, with the exercises. And so the perfect humility, which I'm describing as an intellectual virtue, would seem to be something that is a, an improvement over just plain um, uh, humility that allows you to, to morally follow, follow the laws. But there's other times where, where um, it's flipped yeah. and where you need to have an intellectual virtue in order to see things in a certain way so that you can understand what the moral virtue, what the moral virtue is. Uh, and then on, the, on that, on that uh, I mean, I was just, you know, th that I, I could have written that. Uh, I, it couldn't have been a better editorial for me. Uh, when I saw it, I said, oh my God, this is, I'm going to make my whole talk. Um, and, uh, and, um, and I think that there's a, there's a lot that my field of rhetoric and the field of virtue, ethics, and epistemology can say about civic debate. And, and, and it involves talking about, about um, intellectual and moral virtues very, very directly. And uh, I mean, there's so in my in my in my classes um, right now, um, just trying to decide 
um, what particular position you, you are taking on some of the fake news accusations and, and post-truth uh, arguments that, that, that are going around, but then more specifically on really specific, on, 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 certain, on certain kinds of issues. And, and um, um, I, I'm just going to stop there because uh, there, there's so much to say about how important um, uh, uh, thinking about the media discussions and what I call the cultural conversation that's going on right now in terms of the issues that, that were brought up um, in virtue ethics and epistemology. Great. Thank you. in which you, you give way to the subtle direction of the director and you, you obey and obey and obey in order to reach this level of uh, virtuous imagining. Um, what do you make of like the, the stakes of agency, right? How much of, of virtuous imagining is self-erasure? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'll just make a distinction um, and make sure you bring this, if I don't answer the question adequately, make sure you bring it up in our class when we be tomorrow. Um, make, make a distinction between um, following the director uh, who's an interlocutor in doing the spiritual exercises and the question of who's your superior. Those, those wouldn't be the same thing. So that the, that the, the spiritual director uh, in this particular case, at least in practicing the exercises, uh, is somebody who intervenes at certain points, and especially in some versions of, of, the ex of, of practicing the exercises, is simply an encourager. And you can, you can for example, not go on to the second week if, if you're not prepared, or, or um, not really find the, the, um, the compositions of place very um, uh, fruitful. Okay. Um, and so, so there, uh, I would say agency is encouraged in the in the retreatant rather than rather than erased. Where agency is erased is in certain um, uh, questions about obedience, which is what I emphasized. Uh, um, you're ob obedient to your superior, okay? And that's where um, incorporating that into certain parts of the Ignatian. Uh, spirituality would be, um, to a certain extent, an erasure of agency, but one that has been prior decided upon through your agency. I have chosen to be directed uh, or uh, by my superior in this particular way. And so agency, I think, is crucial in trying to understand um, all of these. I'll say I'll say say this that that uh, uh, this is the first time in let's see how long uh, Linda when were we at at USC together? That's why I was laughing when you said 1972 when he said yeah 1972 that's right <laughs> um, the first time um, and I've been at five taught at five different universities where um, uh, I've been invited by uh, my um, uh, home Department of Philosophy to come and talk. Uh, each of the other places I've, I've been at, um, um, I've had very good relationships uh, with, with philosophy members, but um, the kind of, of work that I was doing just, I don't think, really appealed uh, to, uh, to uh, my uh, fellow philosophers. Um, so I, I really do want to thank you, Jason. Uh, this was, this was uh, an honor to be invited to, to, uh, to uh, um, uh, cross the across the, the, uh, the boundaries here and um, doing the work in uh, um, reading on virtue epistemology and uh, virtue ethics um, gave me a lot of food for thought and uh, I hope to have further conversations. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you.